to you. So I'll pass it off to Dr. Pamela Feliciano to introduce today's speaker. Great. Thanks, Bev. Welcome, everyone. I'm Pam Feliciano, the Scientific Director of SPARC. Today, we are really happy to have SPARC's Principal Investigator, Dr. Wendy Chung, um, with us today. She's going to speak about genetics and autism. Dr. Chung will review basic genetic concepts and share recent scientific progress in autism genetic research. Um, she'll also talk about the genetic aspect of the SPARC initiative. Um, Dr. Chung is a clinical and molecular geneticist. She received her MD from Cornell University and a PhD in genetics from Rockefeller University in New York City. She currently directs the clinical genetics program at Columbia University, and um, she's a renowned clinician, teacher, and mentor. And we're, um, in 2014, she delivered a really popular TED Talk, What We Know About Autism. It's our extreme pleasure to have Wendy with us here today. So without further ado, please take it away. Thank you, Pam. Um, so thank you for that very kind introduction. I'm thrilled to get to speak with everyone today, and I hope we'll be able to answer some of the questions that you might have about genetics and autism. Uh, undoubtedly, we don't have all the answers yet, and that's actually part of the excitement about SPARC is being able to work together to come up with some of the answers to questions that we don't yet have answers to. So we're going to start today with what we do know about autism, um, and this is includes many things that are genetic. Um, we also appreciate that there are some things that uh, we don't know all the answers to, and as I said, that's what SPARC is about, is to answer those questions. Uh, the first point that I want to make is that autism is not um, just one condition. It's actually quite very interesting as well as complex um, and quite really challenging at some times for some individuals. When we think about this, um, everyone with autism shares some similarities. They share some similarities in what we call the core symptoms, um, some challenges in terms of social interactions, in some cases the need for sameness or being able to have um, certain consistency, as well as having some um, behaviors that may be stereotypical or that may be um, quite repetitive. On the other hand, individuals with autism, although they may, may share some of those same core features, may have different challenges that may be different between individuals with autism. Um, we use one term to describe all these individuals, but yet, as I said, the challenges for any one person, even within one family, can be quite different. Um, there are some individuals who are really quite gifted, um, that really have amazing and incredible talents. Um, that can do very specific things, uh, really even much, much better than I can and many others can. Um, and it's really, they are blessed in terms of having some of those talents. Other individuals um, may have particular challenges in terms of behaviors, including things like anxiety or being quite anxious, may have problems with sleep, um, which may be disrupted sleep or inconsistent sleep patterns. They have problems with attending or attention deficit, or what we'll say for short is ADHD, attention deficit hyperactivity uh, disorder. Um, so these challenges can be uh, quite, a, uh, let's see, quite a few different challenges. Um, and as I said, they may change even over the life course, so that one person may have some of these challenges younger, at younger ages. Some of them may resolve or get better, and in some cases they may change as we move into adolescence or young adulthood. Um, in addition, some individuals will have specific medical challenges as well, and seizures or epilepsy or gastrointestinal problems can be some of those challenges. As we start talking about the different um, genetic forms, if you will, the gen different, different genetic subtypes of autism, one of the things we realize is that some of those challenges may be more common within some of those subtypes than others. And to a certain extent, understanding a category of autism, a genetic category of autism, may help, in fact, to predict what some of those challenges may be, but also we hope, more importantly, to be able to start trying to deal successfully with some of those challenges. And let me move to the next slide. So let's start talking about uh, some of the genetic aspects of autism. So as a geneticist, when we try and think about whether or not a condition, in fact, has an underlying genetic basis for some or all individuals, one of the things we do is we look in families. So we look in families, and in some cases, there are particular types of families which can actually answer some of these questions uh, very, in a very robust scientific way. One of the ways we do this is to look at identical twins. So you'll see here these 
cute guys on the left here. Um, identical twins are very unique in the sense that they share the same intrauterine environment, they're in the same womb, um, and they also share the same genetic information. Um, but what's different about them is once they're born, they are exposed to different things. They're exposed to different things in terms of potentially different, uh, even if they're raised in the same household, they may get infections, they may get, uh, they may go to school in different places, they may grow up in different places once they get beyond a certain age. Um, and so there may be different environmental exposures. So that even though their genes might be the same, there might be other factors that are changing. In fact, when we look at those identical twins, um, the likelihood of one twin having autism if the other twin already we know has autism is about 77%. So you can look at that in one of two ways. One way of looking at it is that number is very high. That is that if one twin, one identical twin has autism, it's more likely than not that the other twin will get that diagnosis at some point. On the other hand, the contrast to me is that even though this number of 77% is high, that number is not 100%. Um, so in other words, if it were all about the genes, if one twin had autism, the other twin should have autism. And so that tells me as a geneticist that it's not all about the genes. Genes are an important component to this, certainly, but it's not all about the genes. Let's take another type of twins, in this case non-identical twins or fraternal twins. Um, and in this particular case, again, for fraternal twins who share the same womb, so uh, before they're born they in fact are exposed to many of the same things, but their genetic information is only about 50% identical. So unlike identical twins that are 100% identical, uh, fraternal twins share about 50% of their genetic information. And again, their concordance rate or the likelihood if one twin has autism, it's only about 31% that the other twin will have autism. Again, much, much lower than for identical twins. But the interesting contrast to me is if you look at siblings. So in this particular case, um, Fraternal twins are a very specific type of sibling. They're exposed to many of the same uh, environmental things, either prenatally or after the baby's born. In contrast, siblings, for instance, might be raised in the same household, but they might have different exposures before they're born while they're still in the womb. And depending on exactly how far apart they are in age, they might have different exposures in terms of either infections or some of the other things in the environment they're exposed to. And look at this number by comparison. For siblings, there's only about 20% chance that if one sibling has autism, the other sibling will have autism. Now for these siblings, remember that they also share 50% of their genetic information, just like the fraternal twins, but this number of 20% is clearly lower than 31%. Suggesting to me at least that some of these shared environmental factors before birth as well as after birth may be playing an important role in the fraternal twins, more so even than we see, for instance, in siblings. And of course, in the general population for round numbers, the frequency of autism by comparison is about 1%. So when we think about that, um, it, I hope you'll understand where I'm coming from to say that at least genetics for some individuals are a part of the answer to what causes autism. And so in looking at this, um, this is what we're talking about on the left. These genetic factors in some individuals can be an important cause of autism, but it's certainly not the only cause that we see of autism. There are certainly other, I'm just going to call them environmental factors, but other things that are not encoded in the genes that are exposures that we have over our lifetime. These exposures, as we were talking about, can happen even before birth. So this is meant to be uh, in the womb, and here's the umbilical cord here. Exposures that the mother may have in terms of either infections, if the mother is ill during the pregnancy, medications that the mother may be exposed to, and we know specifically about one type of anti-seizure medication called valproic acid. Uh, even in terms of some of the vitamins or the um, nutritional factors that a mother may be taking while she's pregnant, amounts of folic acid during the pregnancy, all of these factors can be important in terms of the developing brain before the baby's even born. There may be other factors as well, as well either before birth or after birth, um, other chemicals that may be in the environment, other infections that a growing child may be exposed to, 
other pollutants. And in fact, there's probably a complex interplay between both the genes as well as these exposures. That is that it may be certain individuals, a combination of a genetic predisposition with just the right exposure in terms of over the life course, those two together may actually work or, or be the answer in terms of not just being one single answer, but a combination of the answers for certain individuals. The thing that becomes most difficult is to discern for any one individual with autism, is it more the genetic factors, is it more the environmental factors, or is it in fact a combination of the two? And to be honest, before we start doing some other investigations, we oftentimes don't know for any one individual what that answer is. But that's what we're hoping to do in terms of some of the things I'll be talking about today. So, Let's go back. Um, for some of us, let's go back in terms of learning some more of our biology and some of our genetics. Uh, and let me give you some updates that you may not have learned about in school in terms of uh, DNA and the genetics. And, and I'll try and make this um, in a way that's hopefully understandable. Um, you don't have to know all the details to be able to get the concept. So in general, each of us are born with genetic information. This genetic information is like the blueprints or the recipe or the instruction manual that's, the, that's making the instructions for how our body grows, how our body develops, and how it functions in many cases. Um, our genetic information is quite complicated in the sense that we have over 20,000 different genes that encode information, everything from our hair color to our eye color, uh, and to a certain extent, some conditions like autism. As we look at our genetic information, and as we look around the room or around our neighborhoods, we realize that we're all different, all wonderfully different. Wouldn't it be boring if we all looked the same and if we all acted the same? We're showing here just some examples about uh, many of our SPARC participants around the country, and we're incredibly proud of everyone who's participated. Um, and when you look around at the slide, looking at all of these different individuals, you'll see that there are some differences. There are some differences in hair color, differences in skin color, differences in eye color, differences in height, some people wearing glasses, some people not. None of these is particularly bad. Um, you know, they're just differences that we all have. And as I said, um, difference in diversity is in fact what makes us so wonderfully rich and helps us to be able to complement each other. So these differences are not uh, any bad things within our genetic information. They're simply normal differences. And in fact, one of the challenges that we've had in genetics is discerning or understanding what those differences are and which differences genetically uh, are responsible for some of the different traits that we have. Let me be very clear, and I'm quite humble about this. We don't have this all figured out yet, um, but what we're trying to do is learn together with you as we go through this process. So in the same way that our DNA has instructions uh, that make our bodies, let me also give you an analogy. So I like baking, um, so let me give you an analogy that I and my kids do when we're in the kitchen baking. So I will follow a recipe, and this weekend we made chocolate chip cookies. And so in the chocolate chip cookie recipe, we need to have some flour, some sugar, some butter, um, and to make chocolate chip cookies, you need to have chocolate chips. On the other hand, my kids uh, like to be able to be creative, and sometimes they change recipes on me. So in fact, one of the ways that we've changed our recipe is to, instead of using chocolate chips, sometimes we like putting raisins in our cookies. And when we put raisins in our cookies, we still have delicious cookies that I eat way too many of, I must admit, um, but we still have delicious cookies. They look wonderful, they taste wonderful, but admittedly, those cookies with raisins taste a little bit different than our chocolate chip cookies. And again, to me, this is similar in terms of some of our differences in hair color and eye color and skin color. They're differences, but none of them cause us any problems. They simply make a slightly different taste to our cookies. On the other hand, my trickster son, sometimes he likes playing jokes on me. And if he were to play a joke on me and substitute in our sugar jar, salt instead of that, and if I were to put a whole cup of salt into those cookies instead of a cup of sugar, I can guarantee you those would not be the tastiest of cookies. And in some ways, um, that's what happens when we have certain genetic differences. They have effects that are really significant effects in terms of how our body works. 
They're still wonderful people that have these genetic differences, but they can make life a little bit more challenging. And that's what we're talking about for some individuals with autism, is that they may have some of these genetic differences that can make life a little bit more challenging. One of the challenges for us as uh, medical geneticists is when we try to understand all of this genetic information, we're looking at literally three billion alphabet letters and trying to figure out and make sense of all of it. And it looks kind of like this gobbledygook that you're seeing on the screen here. If you look at this, you might start trying to read this and say, W, pod, question mark, A, M, F, K, W, what in the world is she talking about? That looks like gobbledygook. I can't understand anything about what this means. And in fact, sometimes when we look at the genetic information, it's similarly confusing. On the other hand, we get certain clarity because we don't understand all three billion letters yet, for sure, but we do understand a portion of the information. And a portion of the information, these little gold words that I've highlighted here, are little bits of information that get cut and pasted together and actually get made into many of the proteins and other portions of our body that ultimately make things like our hair, our eyes, our brains, our big toes, that these are the instructions that make all of this together. And so now it's easier to read and understand. Four score and seven years ago, and here we can see um, information that now makes a lot more sense. And we tend to focus on this information that we understand. I'm not saying that it's all the information that eventually we need to understand, but this is at least the beginning of our understanding of what this genetic information means about coding some of our differences. And I'm going to come back to this because we've taken a shortcut as we've done the genetics and made a shortcut to look at approximately that 2% of the information that I highlighted in gold. As we do that and realizing that we still don't know what all of that information or what all of those genes do, we also use another um, way to be able to interpret information, which is that we look at not just one individual with autism, but we actually take the power of the family to understand that better. And I'm going to get to it in just one second, but by being able to look at a combination of the father, the mother, and the individual with autism, all together, using it as a family unit actually gives us much, much more power to interpret and understand what that genetic information means. And I'll get to it in just a second, but that's the reason why we keep bugging you. Will you please send in not just uh, the saliva sample from the individual with autism, but also send that sample in from the mother and the father, because as I'll show you, that helps us immensely to be able to understand and interpret the differences between some of those things that are really benign or normal changes in hair color or eye color from some of the ones that are much more meaningful, such as the genes and the genetic variants that cause autism. So let me help understand why the families are so important as we go through this analysis. And again, um, this information can be helpful as we're trying to give you back as individuals within SPARC information that would be, as I call it, news you can use, information that I hope will be meaningful to your families uh, as we try and understand what's causing autism. So the first thing is something that maybe doesn't make sense when you first think about it, but I hope as we talk through it, it'll, it'll make more sense. And that is that an individual with autism could have a genetic reason why they have autism, but it might not be inherited or passed down from the mother or the father. So even though, I've, as I've shown in this cartoon here, the mother and the father pass down their genetic information through the egg and through the sperm, it is possible for a child to have some genetic information that started brand new with them. Each of us, when we have children, each of our children has some genetic information that is unique to the child, that is not present in the mother and not present in the father. So just because we are humans and we are not perfect when we make our children, and I can speak for my own children that we've actually looked at this, there are about 70 genetic changes that are present in a child, not present in either parent. For individuals with autism, some individuals with autism, what's different is that genetic change may land 
in one of the genes that causes autism, one of the genes that makes the brain work differently. And if that de novo or new genetic change is in one of those genes, there might be no family history of autism, that is no one in the family has autism because no one else besides that one child has that genetic change, but it still could be genetic. So again, this is one of these circumstances where there is something that could be in the genes, but it may not be passed down in the family, and therefore it might feel like it's coming out of the blue. No one else in the family has that family history of autism. That's important, and, that's in, and let me just go back for one second. It's important for families to know about this case because some families, not all families, but some families want to know, could I have another child with autism in the future? Could some of my children be at risk to have autism? Could my child with autism have another child with autism in the future? And that helps inform that or answer that question. On the other hand, there are other families in which these genes may actually be passed down from one generation to another. And I'm not going to get deep into the details, but as an example, there are some genes that are along the X chromosome. And for those of you who may remember some of your biology, for women or for girls, we have two X chromosomes shown here. And for males or men, they have one X chromosome and one Y chromosome. There are a small number of autism genes that are located on the X chromosome, and I've shown that with a star here. For some families, that X chromosome with the autism gene can get passed down from a mother to either her daughter, as I've shown here, or her son, but for her daughter, who has another X chromosome to help and be able to support her, she may not have symptoms of autism. However, for her little boy, who doesn't have that extra copy of the X chromosome to support him, he may have some autistic features. And this is important to know, as I said, within families, because within these families, there more be, may be more than one child who ultimately develops autism. And then finally, as just one other quick example, there are some genes um, for autism that, as I say, take two to tango. It takes a combination of genetic information from the father as well as some genetic information from the mother together, and only when it's together that increases the risk of autism for a child. And again, important for some families to know about this if they're concerned about other children in the family having autism. So let me now jump ahead and think about what we're doing within SPARC and specifically trying to answer some of the questions of why, what causes autism, and some of the research that we hope is going to move things forward so that we can ultimately develop better supports for individuals with autism. So let me review what many of you have already done or what I hope some of you might do in the future. Um, and this is just taking you through what's going on within the SPARC research study. And I hope it will give you some updates or some better clarity in terms of what's going on with your samples, if you've already provided saliva samples, or what might go on in the future if, if you want to do this in the future. So the first, what many of you will remember, is that you filled out some information online on the computer. Um, with this information, you registered, you signed a consent form saying that you wanted to be a member of the SPARC community, and then we mailed you some kits in the mail, probably for most of you they look something like this box that came in the mail, so that you could provide a saliva sample. Um, many of you will remember this tube that, to which you provide your saliva um, or may have used some sponges to collect saliva. I'll just remind you that there's a little line here on the side of the tube. Make sure you fill your saliva up to that line if you haven't already and be sure and put your ID label on the tube so we know who's who. You mailed that back and when that came back it came to a laboratory that was extracting or removing the DNA from that saliva sample to be able to generate DNA sequence data. That sequence data, just so that you know, we don't do this on a daily basis. We actually batch these or we run them a couple of times a year. So the, we wait until we get enough samples and we run a large, large number of samples all at once. As we do this, we want to be very confident or very make sure that we are correct with any of the information that we give back to you. 
And so Dr. Feliciano works very hard at making sure that we know what autism genes are, the genes that we know of that cause autism, and we go through and we look at the genetic information for genetic changes that are new in the child with autism and found within these genes that we know cause autism. At this moment, there are approximately 50 genes or 50 genetic places where we're looking for information, and we are, as I'll show you in a second, continuing to reanalyze and increase the number of genes that we realize are related to autism. When we go back, we then identify individuals within SPARC who have these de novo or new genetic changes in these genes. And now it'll make sense, I hope, in terms of why we need those saliva samples from the mother, the father, and the child, because we need all three to be able to show that the genetic change is new to the child with autism. So we're looking at our trios of our mother, father, our child. We're analyzing this data, and we are always being very careful to actually independently confirm the information. So we actually do a double check to make sure any information we give back to you has been checked two independent times. As we do this, we generate a report summarizing all of this information in hopefully relatively simple to understand terms, and then we will be giving this information back to the provider, the healthcare provider that the family indicates and or a genetic counselor that we at SPARC are providing to be able to explain this information to families. We hope that as we return this information to you, it is something that's helpful, as well as, as I'll show you, helps to provide some more specific information uh, in the future for you. As we do this, though, this is not a one and done, and I want to draw your attention to segment number five here. That is that even though we generate the genetic data once, we look at it again and again and again because we don't know everything, and we know we don't know everything. We are learning together, and we are increasing the number of genes that are related to autism over time. Through Spark, through putting everyone's information together, we are learning to the point that we can identify new genes for autism, and as we identify these new genes for autism, once a year we are committed to making sure that what we learn is returned to you as participants within SPARC. And so as we're going through, even if we don't find an answer for you in the first year, we hope that over time a larger percentage of you will get answers as we go through this process. So as we do this, um, We've just put in a relatively uh, quick sort of history lesson for you in terms of autism for the purpose that I wanted you to realize that things don't happen overnight. It wasn't until 1943 when Leo Kanner actually first described autism, and from that time it took until 1991 until we had the first gene, this, in this particular case a gene for Fragile X uh, associated with autism. Since that time, we've had other genes that have been identified, and I have to say there's been a real explosion in terms of our understanding for genetics, so that, as I said, now we're well over 50 and probably counting on a daily basis the number of additional genes that we're identifying with autism. I also want to bring your attention um, to that it's not just all about finding genes or looking for genes, but the whole point in this is to try and develop better supports and better treatments for individuals with autism. And so in 2006 was the first FDA-approved medication that helps treat some of the symptoms of autism. This treatment uh, for irritability is risperidone. But I also want to emphasize that we are far from having everything in our toolbox that we need, everything in terms of educational supports, behavioral supports, treatments, medications. We still have a long way to go. And we hope that, again, with the initiation of SPARC in 2016, that this will help support the next wave that we need in terms of developing new treatments or new supports. So let me also help to set some expectations. Will this be everyone, for instance, in SPARC that actually gets a genetic answer? I hope you'll understand that the answer to that is no. In part, that's no because not everyone is going to have a gene that's caused their autism. 
In part, it's not no right away at least because we clearly don't know all the genetic factors that are contributing to autism. But to give you some sense, from what we've started looking at within SPARC, within this first year, I'm expecting that approximately 5 to 10% of our families who have provided a mother, father, and child will have an identifiable single genetic factor that we can point to as being a major contributor to the cause of autism in that family. That's just in the first year, though, and I'm not sure how quickly this will grow, but it is certain that it will grow over time, and we are committed to being able to continue to provide that information to families over time as we learn it. So if you are one of the families who does receive information from us about the genetic information, the genetic diagnosis, what does that mean for you? How will that actually make a difference in your life, if at all? Well, it's important, I think, to be realistic about what it does and what it doesn't do. The first thing is that for many of you, you have been asking the question of why for an awfully long time. And I do think that will put an answer to at least some of your questions of why. It will provide an end to what could have been a long diagnostic journey for you, having multiple tests, whether they be blood tests or scans or other things because we now think we will have an answer for you if we return that information. And so we hope that will be uh, helpful in terms of giving you some closure and, and running around looking for the answer of why. For some of you, and now I'm on uh, bullet point number two here, you may have been wondering about whether or not other individuals in the family would have an increased risk to have a child with autism. And certainly based on the information, we will be able to give you some better information about whether or not this is likely to occur again within your family and who might be at risk. For number three, some of you, this will provide actually very useful information. So I said uh, that some forms of autism might be associated with things like epilepsy or seizures. Others might be associated with gastrointestinal problems. Others with particular other medical challenges, maybe growing and not being so tall. By being able to provide you with a roadmap, to a certain extent, we will be able to help you identify bumps that might be coming along the road so that you can hopefully swerve to avoid them or be able to plan in advance. Maybe see a specialized type of doctor or therapist who might be helpful in terms of even preventing some of those problems down the road. So we hope that this will be able to provide you with better guidance about what to expect and hopefully even take some things off the table, some things that you might have been worried about, perhaps we will be able to give you some reassurance that those things are not commonly associated with the genetic subtype of autism within your family. A fourth way in which this can be helpful, and I don't want to underestimate this, is simply being able to have others who you can join on this journey together. That is, other individuals that have the same genetic subtype of autism to be able to share experiences and sometimes frustrations, but also in many cases, helpful tips, things that have worked for other families that might be helpful for you as well. And I can say personally, this has been incredibly helpful as I, as a doctor, try and take care of some of my patients and my other families have found this helpful to even connect with people sometimes around the world and sometimes even within your own town, but trying to have that additional support that might be providing more specific guidance. And then finally, as I said, um, in the future, we hope that this is not just about what we can do for today's, but what we can do for tomorrow's in terms of developing better treatments, better supports. This will undoubtedly take further research to be able to identify opportunities, even perhaps medications or therapies in the future, but we will need to rigorously test these and determine whether or not, in fact, they are effective and working. And so in some cases, we will be coming back to those of you who have a genetic subtype of autism because there may be specific treatments that are targeted based on your gene and being able to know what gene that is and hopefully that you're more likely to benefit from that particular treatment either in research or when it becomes approved is something that we hope will be helpful to you in the long run as we go through this. So when we do get the information about this genetic uh, subtype and when we do provide this back to you, we hope that you will be able to get support from many different individuals. This may sound like gobbledygook at the beginning, but it does take some time. 
We hope that you will share this information with your doctors. As I said, we will have genetic counselors available nationwide to be able to help explain this information to you. We will also provide written materials that summarize at least what we know today about this information. And we hope that by identifying other families through SPARC or through another group of families that we have called Simon's VIP, that you'll be able to reach out to each other, support each other, and learn from each other as we go through this process together. What happens if you do not get notified, however, that you have a genetic subtype of autism? Remember, in the first year, it's very likely that you actually will not be notified even if we have run your sample and gone through this. And as I said, that's because there are only 5 to 10% of people that will be notified within that first year. The first important thing to understand and appreciate is that if you don't hear from us, this does not 100% rule out that there is a genetic cause of autism in your family. It could be, again, that you will be contacted at some time in the future as we are able to identify a genetic cause. And so just because we don't contact you doesn't mean that it is not genetic. We don't understand everything about genes yet. If you are anxious, however, to be able to get as much information as quickly as you can, this is not the only way. SPARC is not the only way that you can get a genetic evaluation. Let me also say that there are many wonderful providers called medical geneticists that can help you with clinical genetic testing if you wanted to do that in addition to what you are doing through SPARC. So this study certainly does not replace a consultation that you might have with some of those other medical providers who can be extremely helpful because they know you and your child very personally and can answer some very specific questions that you have. And so let me not, don't use Spark as a substitute if you need to get that medical information specifically for your family, especially in a very, very short period of time. As I said, we, as we go through this process, we will continue to learn and we will continue to reach out to you as we learn information about your specific family as long as you would like to continue learning that information. And we hope that we will have more and more answers for more families over time. So many of you are probably wondering, well, whatever happened to that sample I sent in? I haven't heard about it in a long time. Uh, did they actually receive it? Are they analyzing it? What's going on? So if you log into your Spark account and go to your dashboard online, you will actually be able to see what the status of your saliva kit is. Did we receive it? Did it get lost in the mail? As long as it was received, then we have begun the process of analysis in terms of extracting the DNA, making sure that we have enough of the DNA, and starting the process of the genetic analysis will be going on over the next several months. In small numbers of cases, you may hear from us again if there was a problem with your sample, if there was a problem because we didn't get enough DNA, because there was some problem in terms of uh, perhaps contamination with something. And so I hope that it's a small percentage of you, but if we do come back to you asking for another sample, we would appreciate that because we won't be able to analyze your family until we get that replacement sample that comes back in. And as I said, if you haven't already sent in samples from your mother and your father, uh, it's definitely going to, you are going to be one of the first families analyzed if you get all three of those samples in. And so if you want to jump to the front of the line, uh, do try when it's possible to get in all three of those samples. So some of you might be asking yourself the question, well, you're looking at a whole lot of genetic information. Are you going to be looking at anything besides our autism genes? And if you are, are you going to be giving us that information back as well? When we started in uh, the SPARC study, we really wanted to focus our attention on autism. We wanted to make sure that we were dedicating all our time and our energy to make sure that we were driven by the mission that got, you into, uh, got to think about being in this study, that of autism. So we are certainly not actively looking or trying to look at any other genes besides the ones for autism. So we're not trying to look and see if there's a cancer risk or if there's some other problem with Alzheimer's or if there's a problem with um, other, other medical conditions. However, 
we did realize that if we were to stumble upon some information that could be medically important for you and your family, something that might save your life, we wanted to be able to have a way to get that information back to you on the small chance that we happen to stumble on that information. And so for those of you who have asked for us to give that information back to you, if we happen to find it, we will return that information back to you. This is limited to information where we do think it makes a big impact, something that could be life-saving, such as a risk of a problem with your heart, where we could be able to hopefully keep your family healthy. But again, I want to emphasize that this is not something we are actively trying to do, and we don't expect it to happen very many times. So if there is a family history or something that you're worried about in terms of one other genetic condition besides autism, I encourage you to see one of your own healthcare providers about that to so do make sure that you get that information through some other way. So let me just take a couple minutes to summarize and say that as uh, I hope you've been learning through the webinar today, um, there are many, many different subtypes of autism with many different causes. Some of those are genetic, but many of those we don't know yet what they are. There are also environmental exposures that may be the cause of autism. And I just want to say that one of the things we're dedicated to within SPARC is learning about all of those aspects, the genes and all of those other exposures. And we're going to be coming back to you to help us come up with those answers through questionnaires in the future. By participating in SPARC, if we do identify the gene for autism in your family, we certainly want to get that information out to you. We want to be certain that that information is accurate and correct, and we want to make sure that as we supply you with that information, we give you the tools to understand what it means for you and for your family. There's a long road ahead, though, and as we find these genetic causes, it may not immediately lead to a change in your treatment, or even something like a new medication, and definitely not a cure. So I do want to be reasonable and set expectations about this. It will be a longer journey ahead of us, one that we are dedicated to going forward with and making sure that we continue to invest in the research that we need to realize those promises, but we do know that it's going to take time. We hope that as we do identify some of those opportunities through some of the new genes that we're identifying, we hope that you'll continue working with us and participating in those future research studies that are going to benefit, we hope, many, many members of the SPARC community. So let me stop here and see if we have some questions that have come up through the webinar. Okay. Um, there have been a lot of questions submitted. Um, one of them is, Someone has heard that 500 genes cause autism, so why do we only look at 50 of them? That's a very good question. So we have come up with some mathematical models and calculations to estimate the number of genes that we think should be involved in autism. And the current calculations estimate that this number is about 500. It could be a little bit more, it could be a little bit less. Um, right now this is just an estimate. As I said, as we go through, we have been identifying one by one by one, and right now the number is up to 50, but I have a feeling that number is going to increase uh, within the next six months substantially, the number of genes that are involved. And as we do this, we use um, statistical analysis um, by comparing uh, not just individual families with autism, but actually comparing other individuals to be really rigorous to make sure that, as I said, as we give you this information back, that we won't have what we call false positives or mistakes where we tell you we have your autism gene and, in fact, we're wrong. Um, so as we're doing this, we're being quite careful. Dr. Feliciano is really, really working hard at this and making sure she's leading the team that's doing this and doing a great job. And as I said, I'm sure this number will increase to 100 before long. Um, I think it'll take us a long time to get to 500, but that's what we're about is trying to move that needle upwards. Great. Great. Um, someone asked, how can de novo mutations be avoided? Ah, this is a good question, too. Uh, the bottom line is I don't think they can entirely be avoided. Um, in fact, as I said, for any of us, when you think about this, we have, when we have a child, we have 3 billion letters that we have to copy over, 3 billion letters of our instruction. We actually have uh, what we call ways that they're, they're almost like spell checkers, like you've got on your computer. We have spell checkers in our cells to be able to catch a huge number of the mistakes that we make. But we're humans. None of us is perfect, and each one of us make a certain number of these mistakes every time we have a child. 
Um, so there are no ways, and, and I should say that when this happens, this is no fault. There's not anything that anyone intentionally did that caused this. It wasn't an exposure to an insecticide or medication or a glass of wine that someone had that might have caused this. These things just happen to all of us. Um, it just happens to be particularly, you know, the luck of the draw, essentially, where those genetic changes happen to land and if they land in an autism gene. Right. Okay, someone asked about genetic testing. So if they're a parent with a child with autism and they're planning for another child, should they do genetic testing and why and what would be the benefits? Okay, so genetic testing um, is available. Um, it is covered oftentimes by insurance, uh, but I would recommend that you see a doctor that really knows what test to order and make sure that it gets done correctly. That's oftentimes, although not always, by someone like a medical geneticist, a child neurologist, um, some psychiatrists feel comfortable doing this, um, but individuals that really know what test to order and make sure that the appropriate test gets done and interpreted correctly. For those of you who might be out there who are thinking about another child and want to do this in the relatively near term, so you're thinking about the next, for instance, three to six months, uh, you want to get the ball rolling on things, um, seeing a medical geneticist may be helpful to be able to do in addition to what you're doing in SPARC. If you happen to get the same answer through both, that's wonderful, um, but one of the things about SPARC is, as I was saying, we can't always predict when that's going to happen, and there are other people around you in your community who can be helpful to address some of their short-term questions that you might have in terms of making family planning decisions. And so um, there are ways to go online, figure out through your nearest medical center, or if you talk to your primary care doctor, they can steer you in the direction of a child neurologist, developmental pediatrician, a geneticist who may be able to help. Great. Okay, we got this particular question several times. So in families where they, there are multiple children with autism, they've been getting the advice from doctors that it's not genetic, that it's just the luck of the draw, and people are asking, is that true? Um, is it likely that autism is genetic, or is it more likely that it's genetic in families with multiple affected children? So that's a very good question. Um, Strictly speaking, uh, when we do see autism clustering within families, I can't guarantee it's genetic. So let me be very clear, um, because there could be things that an entire family is exposed to in terms of environmental exposures. So it doesn't guarantee if there are two or three or more individuals in a family with autism that it has to be genetic, but I can tell you the likelihood goes up significantly if there are multiple individuals either that have autism or that may have some other related challenges. And so in fact, one of the things many of us I think realize is that some of those challenges that I said were associated, some of the other um, psychological behavioral things may in certain families also go with autism. The one other thing that's confusing sometimes is that autism may not just be one single gene within a family. It actually may be a combination of several different genetic factors acting together. And as I said, it may also be a contribution of some of the things um, in terms of either before birth or after birth with other exposures. But definitely when you see, especially if you see large, large numbers, you know, three, four, five individuals, and especially amongst close relatives like siblings, then it becomes more likely that it's uh, related to autism genes. Great, great. Um, this is also another question we receive multiple times. People are asking if there's an autistic individual in the family, um, are there other diseases that are correlated with that in the immediate family? So within individuals with autism, there are certain other, especially um, brain differences that we oftentimes see, and I, I illustrated a couple of those. Um, some of those that are important are things like epilepsy uh, or seizures. There are also some other related conditions that may be, um, for instance, developmental delays or, or problems in terms of speech delay or even in certain individuals' intellectual disability uh, that can be associated with autism. Um, for other individuals, there may, with certain forms of autism, be other problems that are more what I would call medical in the sense that certain people can have differences in the way their bodies look. As an example, they may be uh, relatively shorter than other family members. They may have differences in head sizes. Their head size or their hat size may be particularly smaller or even larger, um, and certain individuals may also have differences in terms of being born with structural differences in their bodies. So they may be born with 
uh, what we often call congenital or birth anomalies or, uh, for instance, a hole in the heart or something that may be different about how their uh, intestinal tract was put together. So there may be all of these different differences that can go with different of these subtypes of autism. Um, again, as we have more information about which subtype it is, we can oftentimes be more uh, accurate in terms of predicting what these associated features are. Okay. Um, here's a question. So the, one person is asking about identical twins and noticed on your slide that there's only 71% concordance and wants to know why. Um, and it, could it be factors like weight, like it, there's one twin who weighed a lot less than the other, would that twin have been more fragile to um, or more susceptible to environmental exposures that led to the autism in one and not the other? Yeah, that's a great question. And I have to say one of the real opportunities for us in Spark that we've realized is just how many twins we have in Spark. So for those of you that are twins out there, um, you actually hold some potential answers to some of these questions yourselves, and we'll probably be coming back to you at some point. So identical twins are interesting. Um, there are certain cases um, that we do see things where even though twins are identical, um, there may be significant differences. So we do see something medically called twin-to-twin -twin transfusion in which even twins that are identical and share the same placenta and grow up together in the same womb may actually have significant differences in terms of how big they are at birth. And there may be differences in blood flow as well with some of that twin-to-twin -twin transfusion. Maybe differences significantly in blood flow to the brain that we actually see in terms of fetal growth and brain growth specifically. So there may be, if you will, that may account account for some of the differences that we see between twins. There also can be, even though twins oftentimes, although not always, grow up within the same household, um, you can imagine it's oftentimes the case if one person in the family gets a bug, other people in the family get, get the bug a little bit later. Um, but we don't all react to the bug in the same way. Um, and it's not, you know, we don't always understand why that is. Um, but there are particularly vulnerable times in life, in particular when the brain is developing and growing, oftentimes within the first three years of life, that if that infection should have effects on terms of how that brain is growing and developing, they may be different between one twin or another. And uh, even though you might, both twins might have the same cold, it might have different effects in terms of parts of the body that it's having a greater effect on. So the bottom line is we truly don't know the answer. Um, and I'm embarrassed, not embarrassed to say, but honest to say that there are a lot of things we don't know the answer to. And we're going to learn them together. Great. Okay, a couple more questions. Um, someone says, my sibling has autism. What are the chances that I'm a carrier um, that could cause autism in my children? So that's a very good question. Um, and some of these, when it get into specific details, uh, remember that if you see your own doctors that know your specifics of your particular family, um, you may be able to get some better, more accurate, I should say, information. So number one is that we realize that there are gender differences in autism, that um, in general we see about four to one the number of males compared to females with autism. Um, and this is a little bit of a, you know, twisting your brain for a second, so apologize the brain exercise. But if the individual in autism in your family, if that sibling is a female, then there is a greater likelihood that there is a genetic factor if the individual in your family is the female. Greater likelihood that there's a genetic factor and that may be even just one genetic factor that it's accounting for this. So if that is the case within your family, there is a higher risk of having a gene within your family. The thing that's a little bit convoluted now, though, is many of those genetic factors will only be seen in that individual with autism. You, as the sibling, may not carry that same genetic factor. So it gets to be a little bit more specific in terms of some of the gender issues. What's the gender? What's the sex of the individual with autism? What's the gender of the individual, the sibling who doesn't have autism? You need to take that into account. Um, in general, uh, there are some other factors in terms of, for instance, how significant the autism is, and if it tends to be an individual with autism that also has some other challenges like intellectual disability, if they happen to be nonverbal in terms of being severe, uh, more impacted or more challenged with some of the cognitive issues, then there's a greater likelihood that there's a single genetic factor in those individuals. But again, sometimes those genetic factors are not shared with the other family members because they are de novo. 
And so within this, um, it becomes a slightly more complicated discussion than just simply being able to say there's one easy number and it's 4%. Um, but just to, you know, as a sort of uh, general guideline, it is more likely than not that even though you have a sibling with autism, if it is just one sibling, it is more likely than not that you will have healthy children. But really, as I often say to my patients, what matters most is it's either yes or no. Either you end up having a child with autism or not, and trying to come up with more specific information about whether or not your risk is really zero or 100% or 50%, that specific number, is more helpful than just numbers based on sort of what I describe as population-based data. And so I encourage you for those specific types of questions, do go back and with the specifics of your family, talk to one of your medical doctors or a genetic counselor or a geneticist. Okay, great. I think we have time for one or two more. Um, one question is, do you think that all children with autism should have genetic testing? So that's a Great question. Um, and so in terms of what genetic testing does for you, um, what you get out of that process, you'll remember that I had a slide that summed up um, some different bullet points in terms of what a genetic diagnosis can get for you and what it doesn't yet get for us at this point. I personally think whether or not to have genetic testing, whether it's uh, the genetic research through SPARC, whether it's seeing your own medical geneticist or genetic counselor or other doctor about this, it's a very individual decision. And it's not that everyone should have genetic testing. I think it depends to a certain extent on individuals where they are in their life course, if they have a certain question at this time in their life they want to answer, whether or not there's a particular challenge they're looking for some help with to be able to see if they can get some insight and some help into that challenge. And for some people, it's peace of mind, being able to, they're curious as well as would like the peace of mind of understanding uh, this better. And so with that, I would say there's no right answer. It's very individual. And I'll also say it's individual for the time in your life when those circumstances may change. And if it's right for you, then it's the right answer. Great. Thank you so much, Wendy. I think we're wrapping up.